Hello, and welcome to the Small Employer Webinar Series. Today again, we have our wonderful instructor, Lauren, who's going to be reviewing Element H on Program Administration. Here you go, Lauren. Okay, so our course objectives for today are familiarization with the requirements for the Health and Safety Committees and related documentation, as well as the familiarization with the requirement for OHS administration. The first way we'll hit this today is with our topics for our Joint Health and Safety Committee. We've got three lessons to get through. One is the regulatory requirements. One is the duties and functions of our JHSC and our worker health and safety representative. And the last one is our OC audit requirements. So first we'll get on to our regulatory requirements as normal. We have two situations where we have regulations. One is in the Workers' Compensation Act and one is in the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations. In our legislation, first we have the Workers' Compensation Act, Part 3, Division 4, Sections 125 to 138. And then we have the Occupational Health and Safety Regulation that tells us about when we need to have a worker health and safety representative. For a lot of you, we're small employers, so we're in the situation where we have between 9 and 19 employer workers regularly employed. The key requirement for this is they have to be employed for at least a month. So if you're employing workers for less than a month, this will not qualify. Part of the group is also moved from the small employer program into the larger program by covering the 20 person rule where more than 20 or more employer workers are regularly employed. So in today's presentation, we'll try to touch on those elements as well so that you're familiar with them. The last requirement is if WorkSafe issues you an order to have a committee, they can do that regardless of your number. Next is the membership. Under the Workers' Compensation Act, Section 127, in order to qualify as a committee, you need to have at least four members. You have to have representation from both the worker and the employer groups, and a minimum of 50% must be workers. It's not a problem if you have more workers than managers, but you can't have less. Part of the requirement is for two co-chairs, one from the employer representatives and one from the worker representatives. Their duties as co-chairs is to schedule the meetings and send out the notices, prepare the agenda for each meeting, and arrange for recording and posting of the meeting minutes. Next, we have to move on to the selection of the committee members. And this applies whether it's for a worker health and representative or for a joint health and safety committee member. For the worker representatives, workers must not exercise managerial functions. And the way for me to explain this to you easily is, can I control your pay? If I can control your paycheck or how much goes on that paycheck, then I'm considered to be a manager. If I can't control what goes on to your pay, then I'm not a manager. Additionally, if you have a union present on your site, you have to comply with union procedures for selecting worker representatives. If there is no union, then it's normally done by a secret ballot. When it comes to selecting the employer representatives, this is usually a state of voluntold. You're usually volunteered by your boss to be on the committee. And in a small employer situation, the employer can be the representative. Now this year we have some new legislation, so I'd just like to go over this briefly with you so that you understand. Um, as of April 3rd, 2017, for worker representatives, this is sites with between 9 and 19 workers, they must receive four hours of training prior to them starting their role as a safety committee representative or a workers health and safety representative. For small employers, the easiest way to accomplish this is to take the worker health and safety representative fundamentals online course at the WorkSafe BC website. This will address this requirement. For sites with more than 20 workers, Safety committee members must receive eight hours of orientation training, and the training must cover safety committee functions, roles, and responsibilities. Again, this can be taken online as well, 
or you can have this done uh, with an instructor-led session. One other change in this group of regulations around safety committees is that the committee members and the workplace health and safety representatives are no longer suggested to take part in incident investigations. They are now required to take part in incident investigations. The collection of data, determinations of cause, and corrective actions to prevent reoccurrence. Now, always we've had educational leave in the legislation, but now this educational leave is an additional to the initial training. So I just wanted to make that clear to everyone. Every member is entitled to eight hours of leave to attend OHS education and training. You can share that between members depending on an agreement. And educational leave is paid for at a regular rate of pay um, with course costs and reasonable expenses paid or reimbursed. One of the ways to solve this problem around training is to do a needs assessment by the employer with input from the JHC to consider the required skills to help build a strong committee. So the training, especially if you have uh, seasoned members on your committee, can take on many roles including things like ergonomics and uh, crane operation training, for instance. There's a wide range of courses available through the education and training providers. All you have to do is make sure that if WorkSafe asks, that you can justify attending those courses and the way that they were conducted. Uh, a YouTube video probably would not qualify. So just a brief review of this lesson one. Uh, remember that when you appoint a new uh, Occupational Health and Safety Committee member or a Workplace Health and Safety Representative, they need training immediately to fill their role. And also, as of this year, WorkSafe BC is taking a more active role to ensure safety committee functions are being carried out to legal requirements and the committees are properly trained to fulfill their duties. Um, some of our clients have been exposed to the PACE program and they'll find that this is a lot more uh, prescriptive about their safety committee functions. So moving on to lesson two, our duties and functions. The role of our safety committees are to promote compliance with the applicable legislation, assist in creation of a safe and healthy workplace, recommend actions to improve our, our safety programs, act as a resource to employer and workers as far as being an impartial person usually, and promote our safety principles and practices. That's the underlying concepts of our committees. The normal activities that the committees have to go through are inspections, consultations, investigations, worker concerns and complaints, work refusals, and the proverbial meaning that we all love so much. So let's get started with inspections. The safety committee members are required to participate in regular workplace inspections. Minor deficiencies can be immediately reported to the supervisor and corrected as soon as possible. And only unresolved issues should be discussed at the meeting. Now, I'd just like to touch on this briefly because this is one of the key areas that cause a lot of grief at safety committee meetings, is that the employer should understand that the Monthly safety inspection tour done by the committee is not the sole function of the committee. That inspection is supposed to be a check on the operating systems, not the system. So the work worker, the workers are supposed to have a safe workplace. The employer needs to ensure that. The inspections done by the committee are just to confirm that that is happening. It is not the system to make sure it happens. So sometimes people put too much emphasis on the committee making a safe workplace and not taking their roles seriously. So make sure that management is taking care of their side. Under the new regulations, our safety committee members are now required to participate in investigations. And this is again as of April 3rd, 2017. And they're supposed to assist in collection of the data, evaluating the information and determining causes, and assist in recommending corrective actions to prevent reoccurrence. In the past, a lot of times, in, uh, safety committee members have not been used to the full extent on investigations, and this harms actually the employer, because the safety committee members have a world of experience different from the employer as far as process and equipment that is handled. 
not using that experience actually gives you a poorer investigation and poorer results. Bill 35 was enacted, not this year, but the previous years, on consultation, and it requires joint occupational health and safety committees to advise the employer on significant proposed equipment and machinery changes that may affect uh, worker health and safety. So as an employer, it's best if before commissioning equipment to involve your safety committee to ensure that uh, safety is being taken into account when putting these new pieces of equipment into the process. For example, a manufacturing facility is planning to add a new machine for production. The joint committee may advise the employer on health or safety aspects of the change and how it will affect their process. So again, take advantage of that knowledge on the floor. Next thing that the safety committee can be involved in is worker concern and work refusal. Remember that all concerns should be initially reported to the supervisor. The JSC or JHSC is only contacted if the issue is not resolved to the worker's satisfaction. For instance, a worker has a right to refuse unsafe work. The Joint Health and Safety Committee worker member is only involved if the issue is not resolved by a supervisor to the worker's satisfaction. So again, make sure that your employees are properly trained so they understand this process. Here's the favorite part, our Joint Health and Safety Committee meeting. It is a requirement to have monthly meetings. The effectiveness of this meeting depends on the committee on how effective they want to make it. Unfortunately, very many meetings are not very effective and as a result, the committee is branded as being ineffective. In order to have a good meeting, you need to have an agenda that lists the date, time and location and the items that are going to be brought forward to the JHSC for discussion. Remember that any information that you want to discuss during that meeting should be distributed with the agenda so people have the opportunity to review it prior to the meeting. We need to remember that the mandate of the committee is to move the safety program forward, not manage fix-it lists for the maintenance department. This is the single most um, guilty party when it comes to occupying time at the meeting. So if you have an uh, effective program for managing these fix-it lists, and just an example, that corrective action log that we discussed earlier in the program, it really streamlines your meetings so that these meetings can be uh, flow on to more important things. Co-chairs need to keep the meeting on track, ensuring all issues are dealt with. The safety committee should only deal with outstanding issues and big picture items, things like training and opportunities for improving your program. Again, this should not be a fix-it list meeting. Next, we have the meeting minutes. They must be recorded and provided to the employer who must post it in the workplace along with the list of uh, joint health and safety committee members. One of the things that we found in a lot of our clients is instead of putting push, push pins onto a bulletin board, using clipboards to record this data will allow you to have three months of data posted on the bulletin board, which will save you later on down the road when it comes to auditing and uh, employer or visits from WorkSafe BC. We want to make sure that there's a, a visible communication to the employees and remember there has to be a good copy kept on file for a minimum of two years for regulatory purposes. However, for due diligence purposes these probably should be kept for the length of the company. Now one thing that we do bump into occasionally is when the committee cannot get some resolutions carried forward. So under the regulation there is a process to follow when the Joint Health and Safety Committee needs to move a serious issue forward and they don't feel that they're getting the cooperation they need from management. So the way that this process works is the issue needs to be, ta be detailed and how it affects to the workplace health and safety. We also need to document the background for the things that have done previously that have led to this situation and the possible options to improve the situation and the recommended solutions. And then a possible timeline to put this into place. This is documented and passed on to the management team. Now the management team must respond in writing. Under the regulations, this is 21 working days. 
They can either accept the recommendation from the committee or they can propose an additional recommendation to solve the issue from another way. Even they can refuse the recommendation if they choose to as long as they stipulate the reasons for their refusal. Understand that if someone gets hurt in this hazard that's been documented and WorkSafe shows up on site and the management team has not responded to the safety committee or has refused their recommendations, this would really be the bad thing as far as administrative penalties would be concerned. WorkSafe does not look very kindly on to not cooperating with the committees. So just be warned, if you get one of these recommendations that it deserves respect and should be dealt with in a timely fashion. Lastly, the, JH, the Joint Health and Safety Committee members must be aware of the recommendation or response process, and that needs to be part of the training. Next, we have team building. In order to have an effective committee, the committee needs to work together on safety issues. Everyone needs to participate in the discussions. Understand that there will be differences of opinion, but they need to be respected. No one person or group dominates the meeting. This is especially important with small employers where the employer is a key role in, the, in this committee. Uh, in this situation, we need to encourage the other members to take place, take part and put their ideas forward. At the end, we need all members to feel they've contributed to the discussions and final outcomes. And usually, we like to have the final decision reached by consensus. Sometimes it needs to work around a bit to make this work, but it's always best to have an acceptable solution to all. So, quick review of our Joint Health and Safety Committees. Uh, having a functioning committee will multiply your safety efforts by broadening your available resources. What I mean by this statement is that the employer doesn't have to do everything. You can get your management representatives to help with training, toolbox meetings, and other inspections uh, to help with your safety program. Their knowledge and expert experience base provides better solutions to safety issues and ideas for continuous improvement to your safety systems. So one of the key areas that need improvement in our companies is taking advantage of the available resources. So keep this in mind when you move forward. Next, having legal requirements met and well documented will assist you in a due diligence defense if there should be a serious incident on your site. One of the resources I'd like to recommend to you on our website is we have a model for the Joint Health and Safety Committee membership that includes terms of reference and duties and responsibilities. And it's an easy one for you to use, so I'd recommend that you download it and uh, review it if you're building your program. Next, we're going to move on to our audit requirements for the audit. Under the OC system, Element H, health, Joint Health and Safety Committee, you need to have a terms of reference. And including in that is defined roles and responsibilities that meet or exceed the legislative compliance for the committee and individual committee members. You also need to make sure that members are aware of the terms of reference and identified roles and responsibilities. So you need to make sure there's some kind of documentation that says that it's been reviewed with them or they understand it. This is where the training comes in for your health and safety committee. You also need documentation that says that they've received a new member orientation, that they've taken place in workplace inspections. They've received some type of training in hazard identification and control. That they've taken part in incident investigations. That they're aware of a process to facilitate and evaluate health and safety concerns from employees. What type of processes do you have in place that they have to deal with? Is this hazard forms that we've talked about earlier? Also, safety-specific programs is relevant. So this could be a confined space program or a fall protection program, mobile equipment safety programs, or process safety gas programs. Again, if your safety committee members are following up on this, they need to know what those programs say. Also, this annual training leave. 
Again, as you have members that have been with you for a period of time, you'd like to spread the training out to different parts of your committee and make sure that they're taking training in different aspects so that all members of the committee can benefit. Section H talks about involvement in health and safety activities. Again, do we have a documentation of any recommendations that have been put forward? Workplace inspections that have been conducted. This can also be things like commissioning for new equipment and incident investigations, both for injuries, near misses, and possibly process loss. Next, we need to take a look at the records. What do our minutes look like? Are they, do they contain all the required elements? And are they properly posted and communicated to employees? Is there a venue that allows this communication to take place? Usually we like to recommend a safety bulletin board where all this information can be collected in one spot and it's easy to maintain. Joint Health and Safety Committee recommendation process. Does the management team have a process for reviewing the recommendations? And is there any records of responses when recommendations are not implemented? Make sure again that the committee members have been trained in the process. So additional resources for this particular section are our program model and it's located on the MSA website under the Learning Center Small Webinar Series. Okay, so in order to review your program, my suggestion is that you print out the MSABC program and compare it and make sure your program meets those requirements and that way you won't be missing anything. So our first polling question of the day, does everyone understand the requirements for our Joint Health and Safety Committee committees? And I'll give you a minute to answer that. Great, everyone understands that, so we can move on. Our next topic for today's session is the Occupational Health and Safety Program administra Administration. We've got four sections of this one, the regulatory requirements, the program administration, availability of access to regulations, and the OC audit requirements. So let's get started with that. So under this section, we only have the occupational health and safety regulations to worry about. And they talk about the contents of the program. And there's multiple um, safety regulations for the types of documentation that your program has to mention. And I'm just going to mention a few of them today so you have an idea of what's out there. One of the ones that is very important is to make sure you maintain your first aid records. This is under part 3.19-2 under first aid records and they must be kept for a minimum of three years. Another one of concern is if you have any employees that are exposed to hazardous chemical or biological agents. This is under section 5.54-5 and it talks about the amount of time that you have to keep your records and investigations recurring, recurring to that offense or that issue. Also, we have one for chemical and biological agents, radiation exposure. A few of the ones that we're pretty much familiar with, I believe, are things like joint committee reports. Under section of the Workers' Compensation Act 137, it must be kept for a minimum of two years. However, maintaining this longer will help with your due diligence defense if you have an issue somewhere in the life of your company. Having 15 years of consistent records means quite a bit to WorkSafe BC in an administrative penalty situation. Things like machine inspections are required for the life of the machine. And this includes maintenance records. Worker orientations are designed to be held indefinitely. Workplace exposure to substances are 10 years. Hearing tests, as long as the employee is actively in employed or involved with your company. Confined space entry permits are one year after completion of the job. Training records are three years. And records of investigations, discipline and safety meetings uh, for due diligence should be kept indefinitely. 
So just a review of lesson one. If you have a good document system to support your safety system, you'll have accurate, up-to-date information on programs, policies, and training. Having your legal requirements well documented and currently dated will assist in a, in a due diligence defense if you have a serious incident. So now we get into the ones that we have to deal with a little bit more, and that's the review of safety programs. All the programs that we build need to be reviewed on a regular basis because there's obviously changes in regulation, contact people, process equipment, and overall effectiveness. So we want to be monitoring these programs and policies for improvements. The administration addresses the following issues. Proper document management and retention. Knowledge of the applicable legislation to ensure compliance. It makes you have an ongoing awareness of legislative changes. It gives you a regular review of your management system and allows you to set annual occupational health and safety goals. Remember that your documentation should be current, meeting the requirements of the regulation and training standards. Policies should be relevant to site and tasks assigned. This one's really important because many companies feel that they can use an occupational health and safety system from Toronto. And as a result, when they actually have a serious incident, they are shocked when their program does not meet the standard because the regulations are different in Toronto than they are in BC. So again, you want to make sure that your regulations and your policies are relevant to the site and the tasks that you're actually doing. Reviews sh should be scheduled in advance on a regular frequency. And when you're getting started, it's easy to do an annual review to make sure that all your people, procedures, and equipment is still valid for the next year. Planning is an essential for a good health and safety program. Long-range planning helps set targets and goals and ensures continual improvement. It also forces you to take a look at your systems critically to ensure that they're actually providing you with the service that they design, are designed for. And it also opens up your thought process to areas where you need improvement, such as we've eliminated a lot of injuries, but now all our injuries are MSI-type injuries. How is our MSI program doing? Why have we not spent more time on MSI training, for instance. Um, a solid documentation management process allows us to go back to the record and find how many incidents have we had with this piece of equipment and how many type of injuries on this type of equipment. Are they the same? It allows you to measure the effectiveness of your programs and your controls. So a few things to remember. Program administration is a legal requirement. It's best to follow a document management system for tracking changes and revisions so you know which documents are current. So a little bit of a review. Having a good document system will support your safety system with accurate, up-to-date information on programs, policies, and training. Having legal requirements well documented and currently dated will assist in a diligence defense. So, does everyone understand the requirement for documenting safety policies and training records? And I'll give you a minute to answer that quick question. Great. Let's keep skipping along today. Next, lesson three, availability of regulations to workers. This is something that's quite often overlooked. How do workers access regulations when required? Is it via the internet or printed copies? So if we look at internet access, there is a few issues you need to overcome. Sometimes it can cause security issues. Sometimes connections and equipment are not always available to people working on the floor. And if we put computers on the floor for this application, sometimes it can bring in computer usage issues. Conversely, if we choose to use printed copies to make our workers aware of the regulations, they're usually out of date. It's very tough to maintain uh, currency with your printed regulations when they're changing all the time, and it's, it's difficult to maintain. Sometimes it's difficult to locate. Sometimes they're located in offices to keep them 
uh, filed properly and then they're no longer accessible on night shifts and other shifts. So just remember that having a good way to access regulations will improve the efficiency of your operation. Depending on your type of operation, you'll have to choose which ones to use. But understand those are just a few drawbacks of the different types. Having the legal requirements available will improve understanding of the required actions and make sure that people are aware of their decisions before they take action. So does everyone understand why workers need access to the Workers' Compensation Act and the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations? Again, I'll just give you a minute to respond to this. Great. Let's keep on skipping through here. Next, we're on to the OC requirements. So in order to get all the marks you need for a program under the OC requirements, you must have these seven elements. An occupational health and safety policy statement of the aims of the program and the responsibilities for health and safety. You need to have regular inspections of premises, machineries, tool, equipment, and work practices appropriate written instructions for workers, periodic management meetings to discuss health and safety, and this is multiple periods including toolbox meetings, joint health and safety committee meetings, and management meetings, investigation of accidents and other incidents in order to take action to prevent similar incidents, records and statistics to show where you've had your incidents and where your improvements need to take place, and instruction and supervision of workers. So these are the requirements under OC. The first one is your occupational health and safety goals. So does the organization set occupational health and safety goals and are they aligned with the business plan? And again, you'll find this very quickly when we ask the um, senior management how they deal with the occupational health and safety goals. Ideally, this would like to be set as part of your year-end planning. Next, we move on to documentation control and management. Do we have a documented process to manage your OHS documents and paperwork? And is the process well utilized? Again, is there a copy of the Workers' Compensation Act and Occupational Health and Safety Regulation available for employee review? This can be online or this can be printed, depending on your choice. Next, we have system evaluation. Is there a process for evaluating the system? The process should be implemented, and it shows that the documentation has been updated when changes happen to legislation. A health and safety activity summary of what's gone on. Statistical review of incidents. Do we know what incidents we had? Do we know what types they are? A statistical analysis to identify trends. Follow-up actions based on the trend analysis and follow-up of actions implemented. So did they occur? So uh, just a quick review of this section. Failure to retain documentation and failure to locate documentation are two common ways that companies lose marks in their audit process. This is really unfortunate because if you've taken the time and effort to do these things, and then you can't find the documentation, you're going to get no credit. So my goal here of this session today is to make sure that you realize that if you're going to do the training, you're going to build the procedures, take the time to, to work with your employees, make sure you get credit by properly storing and organizing the information so that you can find it during the audit process. Now, one of the things that we did for you at the start of this program was to provide you with a binder so that you could keep this stuff in, a, in one place so that you could find it when you're looking for it. And that's one of the easiest, simplest, low-tech ways to keep this information straight. So again, uh, we can lead you to water, but we can't make you drink. So however you would like to take care of your documentation is up to you, but uh, it would be a shame for you to lose a lot of marks because you couldn't find the documentation you're looking for. Questions? <coughs> Okay, William, you have a few questions for me today? I do, Lauren. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. It went very well. I have a couple questions here from the group. 
the first question, what if your worker representative is not available to attend an incident investigation? Okay, this is, happens quite often, especially with companies that have multiple shifts. You don't always have representation from all the different types of shifts. But what you can do is you can simply substitute a worker from the same shift to help with the investigation. If you do this, this is a good start, but I would also recommend that the acting member of the Joint Health and Safety Committee or Worker Health and Representative, Health and Safety Representative, also reviews that investigation and still has a chance to contribute anything in the way of corrective actions or um, methods of, of preventing reoccurrence and that he's also brought up to speed with the incident that happened. So again, even though he wasn't there for, or he or she wasn't there for that particular event, uh, they still have an opportunity to take part and they sign off on that investigation. That makes total sense. The second question I have is, I have a man lift at my facility. How long do I need to keep the maintenance records for this man lift? This is a really good question because man lifts have just come in to vogue in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, you need to actually keep these records for the life of the machine. If you are actually purchasing a man lift from another party, you should ensure that you get the maintenance records with that machine when you purchase it because any damage to that equipment uh, will show up in this maintenance record. And if there's been repairs to the boom or whatever, it might require additional inspections on your part to ensure that those, those repairs were made adequately and that they're standing up to time. That makes a lot of sense. I know personally I have purchased equipment in the past and not requested maintenance records, but your description of why I should makes total sense. Lastly, I have one question. Do all Joint Health and Safety Committee courses or Worker Health and Safety Representative courses that get taken need to be approved by WorkSafe BC prior to being taken? Well, the easy answer is no. But saying that, you also should be able to justify why your committee has taken these courses and that there is a bit of a paper trail that shows confirmation of understanding. Watching a video on YouTube will not necessarily coincide with those requirements. But if you decide to send your, uh, one of your worker health and safety representatives off for rigging training so that he can review the, uh, your procedures for crane training, for instance, that would be likely accepted by WorkSafe on review of his course. That sounds, sounds great. great. Thanks very much, Lauren. Those are all the questions that I have for today. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. I'd like you to remind you that our next webinar session will be on June 7th and it will be our last session in this series. So it will be on um, emergency preparedness and I'd like you to bring any questions that you've developed over the last period of, of a couple months to that session if you have any concerns prior to us ending this session and also if you have any suggestions for improvement we'd be welcoming those as well. So have yourself a great day and thanks for attending today.